Hello again, welcome back to the series on professional development skills for engineers. Today's a little bit different. Today, instead of talking about a specific skill set, perhaps like how to give an oral presentation or how to write something, I talked a little bit about graduate school. It's a topic that I've actually had a lot of questions about over the years here at Ohio State, so I try to want to put it all on film here. So we're going to talk about a couple of different things. What is grad school and why you might want to go, how you pay for it, and then how do you apply and how you apply well. I can't tell you how many applications that I read are just really bad. I want to stop reading them after the first couple of paragraphs. We get well over a thousand applications per year here at Ohio State to our graduate program and only accept about a hundred or less. So how can you rise to that top 10% with a great application? So first, what is grad school? Grad school is a lot of different things. First of all, it's much less structured than the undergraduate. The undergraduate, you typically have what we refer to here as Ohio State as the bingo sheet. You take so many courses per semester, these courses this semester, these next courses the next semester, on and on you go until you get to the last box, check out the last course, and you're done. It doesn't work that way in grad school. You have much fewer courses at one time. Typically, my grad students are taking only about two on average, maybe three on the high end of courses per semester, which is a lot more time to work on their research in addition to taking their courses. You take courses based on your own interests too. I tend to hate fluid mechanics. I'll admit it, I'm in it to hit people here. I, As an undergrad, I like the design, I like the kinematics, I really did not like the fluid mechanics courses. So you know what? You know what? I haven't taken another fluid mechanics course in my whole life after I took fluid two under the quarter system system here at Ohio State. You can take the classes that you want based on what you're most interested in, and then you have time to work on your research, which is also something that you also should be interested in as well. So you can take the classes you're interested in to work on the product that you're interested in as well. Because you have some of this more time, you have more time to get into things in more depth, improve your critical thinking skills, work one-on-one -on -one with faculty members, and work on a small team, typically the other people in, in your lab. So in many ways, this is much more freedom in graduate school. I remember when I started grad school, I wanted to know what classes I should take my first quarter in graduate school. Students told me, well, you'll figure it out. I wasn't comfortable with that. I want to know, first semester, you take this. Next semester, you take that. Or at the time, I was under the quarter system. You take these classes, then these classes. They just said, oh, you'll figure it out on your own. I was very uncomfortable with that. And I still see a lot of first-year grad students wanting to know, well, what should they take? It's really it's about your opportunity to figure out what you want to take to benefit your own career. As I like to tell my grad students, what tools do you want in your toolbox? What benefits you in your career long term and your career short term to help accomplish your, your research project as well? Also, in your grad school, you can specialize. You can become an expert. I became an expert in biomechanics. Other people became experts in mechatronics, but even within biomechanics, I became more of an expert in, more, in orthopedic biomechanics and neuromuscular biomechanics. I have some friends who became experts in cardiovascular biomechanics. Other people became experts in mechanobiology. You can get very specific as to what it is that you're going to be specializing in, then you become an expert in that field, it depends on how long you're going to be there. You again, again, you have a lot of this flexibility in terms of products you work on, courses you take, much more flexibility than you have in grad school. And you also have a lot of freedom, particularly the longer you go in, into grad school. If you're doing undergrad research, you might have a very strict recipe that you have to follow. By the time you get to the PhD in grad school, I give my students very little direct guidance as well. We only discuss results at the end. It's up to them to figure out what they're going to do, why they're going to do it, how they're going to do it, and then try things out at the end. So you have much more flexibility, much more freedom, and much more ability to be as creative as you what, you what you can be. You also learn a lot of skills on designing experiments, doing research, project management, all of which can lead to career advancement opportunities. These skills on leading a, leading a team, managing your own time, establishing deadlines, goals, all that kind of stuff really helps to your advantage with career management. You can develop your writing and public speaking skills as if this online series wasn't enough, you have a chance many times in grad school to write abstracts, to write papers, give oral presentations. The more you do that, the better you get at it, the better you get at it, and general improves your problem solving skills. Here's an open ended problem go. And I want to know the answer in about a year from now. Like I work with my students in, in an interim, but the ability to tackle this open ended problem is a great 
benefit of going to graduate school. People always say, well, I want to go out into the quote-unquote real world or go out into industry, get some more experience there, then I'll come back and go to grad school later. Well, when Ohio State transitioned from quarters to semesters, we brought in a bunch of our alumni and a bunch of the employers who employ our, alum, our alums as well as to when they should or should not go, go to graduate school. And people say, well, if they have above a 3.5, you should definitely be going to, going to graduate school. And then I, we asked them about, what's this? well, what, they want more experience or that sort of thing. And pretty much universally, all the employers said, okay, if you're doing a master's thesis, ability to do this open-ended research product on your own for a year, year and a half, two years, that's experience. You can, you can demonstrate the ability to handle a big project and gain that experience by doing your doing your master's work. Also, might when you want to go to school, you can get new and different challenges for a wider choice of employment and business options, higher quality employment opportunity as well, and also improved salary. I refer to these points in a couple of different ways. You had a higher starting salary, typically you have a higher slope to your line in terms of salary, so you get bigger raises sooner and faster, and there's really no ceiling as to what you can do in your career. I have, a, I have a friend from graduate school, graduate with his PhD, and he did not want to go into academia, he wanted to go to industry. So he started off in R&D of, of his particular company. So I'm at a conference the next year, he was then vice president of R&D. Following year, he was the executive vice president of research and development, whatever the next step up in the ladder was. That I didn't see him for a year or two, and I asked him, hey, how's it, and I saw him up in the following conference, I said, hey, how's it going? So are you president of your company yet? And I was joking. He reached into his pocket, pulled out a card. He was president and CEO of his company because he had a PhD. There was no ceiling as to where he could go with his, his, his degree. I know a lot of talented undergraduates who are involved in a bunch of activities. They are president of their sorority, their officers and their fraternities, student activities, ASME, all those sorts of things. They like having leadership. They like having this flexibility. They get out into the take a job. So it was great for the first year or two, but then I get the emails like, hey, Rob, I think I need a little something more because they realize there's a certain cap to what they can do with a, with a, with a bachelor's. Whereas if they had a master's, they may have a little more freedom, a little more autonomy and ability to maybe manage a small team with a, with a master's degree. PhD, there's really no limit as to what you can do there. I know some companies that have some sort of secret, secret building where the bunch of PhDs there who are working in R&D are dreaming up the next series of projects that's going to hit the market in five or ten years. And these are all PhDs just thinking up crazy new projects and new products with that degree. And they can only do that because they have a knowledge generating degree here. The table showing here some average starting salaries from a couple years ago from at Ohio State, but as you can see for both aerospace mechanical and nuclear graduates, you the starting salary tends to go up and go up quite substantially with the higher degree that, that you have. So you might want to go to grad school if you want more flex more flexibility, more in, in your in, in your career, you might get you get you into a specific career like I want to be a professor, I need a PhD to be a professor, so that there I went. But you can also get higher starting salaries, more responsibility, and greater increase in your salaries sooner. So okay, I want to go to grad school. Great. Isn't it expensive? Most students, in fact, over 90% of students here at Ohio State in mechanical engineering are paid to go to grad school. A lot of different ways you can do this. One way is through fellowships, whether these are fellowships from your own university at Ohio State, they're, they're typically one year, sometimes two or three years, or national fellowships, such as the National Science Foundation, Department of Defense, NDSDG, Hertz, all these sorts of things, or it's essentially a scholarship, but on the graduate school level. So it allows you this great flexibility to work for whoever you would like because your tuition, your stipend, and your fees are paid by this other entity. Other common ways of being supported are departmental support. Graduate research associates are paid by a faculty member to do research, and this is directly funded by a faculty member. In many ways, this is a pretty good deal is that you graduate from either master's or most definitely with your PhD when the research is finished. So if you're working on the research and getting paid to do it, you need to do that anyway, so it kind of works out well in, in the end. Also, there are GTA, so Graduate Teaching Associates. They are leading a lab or recitation 
grading papers, working with labs, teaching typically lower level undergraduate students, assisting the professor, typically here about 20 hours a week of teaching responsibilities, then you're able to do your t research and your classes in uh, time beyond that. So what does this cost uh, you for all these forms of support? Again, some of the more prestigious fellowships can earn 30000 or more per year in stipend, which is actually a pretty good living. Some other averages for university fellowships can start between 1750 1700 up to 2000 per month, like I'm filming on the slide here. All in all, you can eat, you can have an apartment, you can go out and do things. You're probably not buying a new sports car, but you have a nice way to live and live, um, live fairly well while you're still in school. So other ways to pay for it, some companies have some sort of company program where they will pay for you to go to grad school. If you really like that company and want to stay with them, that's a great benefit to them. In some ways, it may limit the amount of time you have to uh, take classes because some companies only will send you to a campus for a semester or maybe multiple semesters. Some of the classes are offered at the company, some are after, offered at the, at, the, at, the, at the university. So it might limit you in terms of what classes you could take. The research you might do might only be able to do it with a certain faculty members or research that benefits the company, so that might take away some of your flexibility. And some of these companies also may have a work requirement, that if they pay for your master's, you agree to then stay at the company another two, three years or something after graduation. It kind of varies by the company. But if you like where you are, it's great, so you can go and do that. If you really don't like what you are, having the company pay for it is not going to able, allow you that flexibility to move on to something else uh, uh, otherwise. Another option is to pay for it on your own. This should be the last, last, last resort if all possible. There are many, many talented students here that have found GTAs G and GRAs that they couldn't get themselves a fellowship. If, I say, if you're paying for itself, something should have gone wrong along the way. It may have to pay for yourself for a semester, maybe max. Like I said, here at Ohio State in our department, we have over 90% of our students are funded their first uh, at any one time. Typically, by I get to the second semester, nearly everyone is picked up. There are always a couple people who are legitimately pay for, paying for it on their own because they want the flexibility to take the classes they want, work for whom, whomever they would like, and not be quote unquote tied down with a certain GRA or GTA. It does happen. But you should not be going into the grad school decision thinking, how can I come up with this 50000 rubber per year? More, 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 much more likely than not, you'll be able to get someone to pay for you to go to graduate school. So if you want to go, how do you get in? Here are the types of things you need to get into graduate school. You need an application. These ask you things like your name, your address, things like that. That's pretty easy. Next, you need your academic transcripts. You should be able to send away for what grades you got in what class. GRE, most schools need, ask you to take the GRE. If you're staying at your own school, they might waive that requirement to take the GRE like here at Ohio State. If we have our own undergraduates that want to stay at Ohio State to go to grad school, we would waive those GRE score requirements unless they want to compete for a, a fellowship. Then you need your CV or your resume if you're an undergraduate. Typically, most schools ask you to send that in. Then typically the most difficult things for students to get are letters of recommendation and writing what's known as a statement of purpose. So let's take those last two at the end, because if you don't know your address, you shouldn't be going to grad school anyway. If you don't know your name, you have bigger problems than what you want to do to grad school. So the application, transcripts, taking the GRE, writing a resume, most people can handle that. It's really these last two that we have some more difficulty in what separates really good applications from just the mediocre applications. So letters of recommendation should say you walk on water. You are the best candidate these people have ever seen. The people who are writing these letters need to speak your ability to take challenging courses and do research in grad school. These people should know you very, very well. The best letters that I've written for my students to apply for uh, national fellowship awards, grad schools at other universities because for whatever reason life has taken them somewhere else, postdocs, uh, grants, things like that. I've written three, three, four page letters of recommendation just gushing about someone. You need to ask people who can write you that overly gushing type of letters. The generic letters don't really help you. And in fact, they hurt you. 
I've had people come up to me asking if I could write them a letter. I said, I don't know who you are. I can write, I've had you in my class, here are the scores you got on the exams and the project, here's your final grade. I don't know you beyond that. That doesn't help you. In fact, it hurts you in the eyes of the reviewer, because if I'm reviewing grad school applications, which I do, and I see that all I, this person could get is a short paragraph saying what, what they were, what classes they were taking, what grades they got, that doesn't, is not very impressive, impressive to me. So the generic letters don't help you very much, and the fact they do hurt you. So it's preferable to have letter writers have a PhD. If you're wanting to do research in grad school, or you need to do research in grad school, you want people who can attest to your ability to do research and take challenging courses. If you have a PhD, you've done research, that person has done research and done challenging courses to get the PhD. Managers at co-ops are okay, but limit them if they don't have a PhD, and typically balance is more PhD writers than not PhD writers. So a question is, how do you get good letters? You go to office hours. You need to get to know the professor. Get to know the professor and talk to the professor. When I give this talk to students here at Ohio State, I have a room for maybe 50 people. I said, okay, who goes to office hours? And I have people going like this, kind of hiding their head in their hands, trying to look at the floor, look anywhere else at me. Maybe five out of 50 people actually go to office hours and talk to the professor. And here's why. You're considering going to graduate school, so probably you're pretty smart. If you're smart, you tend to understand what's on the homework. If you're doing what's on the homework, you're probably doing well on the exams. So you don't think you need to get help in office hours. The problem is, since you're not going to office hours, the professor does not know you. The professors don't know you. They don't know you well enough to write a letter on your behalf. So I encourage everybody to go to office hours, even if it's just to double check some sort of information on in lecture, double check a homework question, just start that dialogue with easy stuff like getting, uh, like checking homework. If you're a little more daring, go to the office hours, talk to the professors about how they got their, their research, what they're doing now, where they went to grad school, how they choose, life experiences of the professor, anything like that. Here at Ohio State, the first Friday of every month, I hold what's known as a first Friday lunch, where I go out to lunch with students and the rules, we can talk about anything other than what's in a course. So in those lunches, I've talked about where people are going to grad school, if they're going to grad school, or they're doing undergrad research, teams they're on, sororities, fraternities, ASME, all that other stuff. And the people that go to those lunches and come to my office hours, I know really well. So maybe I've only had them in one or two classes as an undergrad, but because I know about them as a person, I can write a one to two page letter of recommendation for them very easily. I'm much happier to write those letters than I am for the generic person that only sat in the, in the 20th row of the room and says, hey, can you write what I did, did, did in, in the class? So some other tips on how you write these letters. Give the letter writer a current CV. If you don't have a current CV, give them a resume and your academic transcript. Maybe you've done great in my class, but you're terrible in every other class. I want to make sure my uh, comments are in context so that I'm not saying you're the best student I've ever seen, you're getting C's and D's in you, all your other classes. Maybe I can spin that a certain way, but I need the information able to spin that. Also, if I have your resume or CD, I can maybe highlight other things like your community service, your teach, you teach kindergarten and preschool at your, at, your, at your church on Sundays, volunteer at the food bank, I can bring out some of your character as well. It is okay to ask certain letter writers to focus on certain things. So if you have three people writing you letters, you might have some people focus on your community service, some people focus on your, your academic coursework performance, and other people focus on your research. You can ask people to highlight certain aspects of your uh, career in the letters. That's perfectly fine. Lastly, you should send a thank you note. It's really great to get that uh, note, hey, thanks for writing me the letter. And then again in the spring, hey, Rob, I went to Georgia Tech, or I went to Virginia Tech, and you're writing me a nice thank you note. Handwritten notes are really spectacular, by the way. Writing me a nice thank you note to, thanks for writing me the, those letters of recommendation. I got into all these places. I eventually chose here. I'm really excited. Here's what I'm going to do. Thanks for all your help. I appreciate it. I have a nice stack of those here in my office that really um, are great memories for me, and I really hang on to those. Just shows that, 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 that appreciation. So, okay. 
you've done the GRE, you've done the application, you have people writing you letters, now you've got to write something pretty important. It's called the Statement of Purpose. It has a couple parts. First, you've got to explain to them why you want to go to grad school, what makes it interesting to you to go to grad school. And then, why do you think you are qualified to go to grad school? When you say you are qualified to go to grad school because of performance with undergraduate research, whether that's for a senior thesis or you're doing an REU type experience, project teams, jobs, co-ops, internships, year-long capstone experiences, class project work, you're taking apart cars in your garage, you're building assisted devices for local nonprofits, anything that demonstrates your technical ability to do research and do higher coursework. So you're interested in going to grad school for all, the, for all these reasons, why you're qualified, then what do you want to do when you're in grad school? While you're there, you want to identify what your general area of research is going to be. In my case, it was biomechanics, biomechanics with a little bit of, of, of design as well. So what I, do I want to do with my research? And if all possible, and please do so, list names of faculty at the specific school with whom you wish to do research. I want to work with Professor Siston in the Neuromuscular Biomechanics Lab because of the ABCDE, the following reasons. Professor Minos Srinvasan in the Movement Lab also is interesting to me because of the such and such and such and such reason. Professor Ajit Chowdhury in the Sports Biomechanics Lab would be my third choice because of the following reasons as well. You do those things, great. Shows me you have done research on your end, you've read my website, other people's websites, you know what you want to do and you know why you want to do it. That tells me you are a serious person and you're serious about coming to Ohio State and coming to work with my school. I can't tell you how many applications I read that list your prestigious university and it's a generic letter that's sent to all the different schools. They don't even change the name to The Ohio State University. Some people say I want to go to o Ohio State and then they don't even go deeper as to what they want to do at a particular school. Naming what you want to do is fairly important fairly important. I have a bunch of people that wrote here that say they want wrote me and say they want to do some certain areas of research because their work with satellite control messes perfectly with the interest in my lab. It does not. So if they say they do this and I do something completely different, they're not a good fit for me. And if they're not serious enough to look at what I do prior to applying, there's no way they're gonna be serious enough once they once they once they Get, once they get here. could also be to your benefit. If you say you want to do these things and we don't do those things at the school, which has happened to a couple applicants here, you're not a good fit. Because if you have your heart set on a certain type of robotics, for example, and we don't do that type of robotics here at Ohio State, you shouldn't come here to Ohio State. I'm going to work on, say, cardiovascular biomechanics. We don't do that in mechanical engineering at Ohio State. There's someone in biomedical engineering that does cardiovascular biomechanics. So the more specific you are, even at the school, maybe we kind of shuttle your application around. Hey, they applied here. You should be, be better served if you're going to somewhere else. So be specific as to what you want to do at the school. It's to your benefit in terms of getting into the lab. It also allows us to identify whether you're a good fit and where, in, where we should be doing at, in grad school. Then what do you want to do after you get out of grad school? Do you want to be a professor? Do you want to work in industry? Do you want to work at a national lab, work at a hospital, all those sorts of things? What do you want to do when you get out? Because presumably your goal is to not to stay here for the rest of your life. You want to get trained with a master's or a PhD and then do something with that degree. So give us some sort of sense of direction or sense of purpose as to what you want to do when you get out of the school. So some tips, please no fluff. Please, please, please no fluff. I can't tell you how many applications that have begun with, I thirst for knowledge. Every day I wake up seeking to quench my thirst from the fountain of knowledge. And if I have the once in a lifetime opportunity to come to your esteemed university and quench my thirst from the fountain of your knowledge in your department, it will be a dream come true for me. No one talks like that. I'm one of the nerdiest people you are met. I don't talk like that. So don't fluff it up with all of this. You're prestigious. You're famous. Uh, university. You're so esteemed. All that kind of 
stuff as to how wonderful we are as faculty and how your life's mission is to come and work with us. You know, it's not. Be honest as to what you want to do. I want you to tell a good, cohesive story throughout the statement of purpose. What got you interested in this field, why you want to go to grad school, why you want to come here based on the things that you've done in the past that qualifies you to do this research with these people in this lab because it s prepares you to be a president of CEO at Ford, lead R&D at a medical device company, work in a national lab. Tell me that cohesive story throughout. Make sure they all tie together. Tell me your story. My story is much different than your story. So don't tell me what you think I want to hear. A lot of people try to write these things. I say, well, they want me to say it this way, so that's what I'm going to write. No, no. We want to know why you're interested in going to grad school. I went... I was interested in biomechanics because of a lifelong speech impediment, so I know my neuromuscular system wasn't working quite so well. I grew up playing with Legos, Tinker Toys, Transformers, Luke's robotic hand in Empire Strikes Back. That's not one of the coolest things I ever saw in my life as a young kid. Then when I got a car accident my senior year in high school and I and I I broke my hip, started to walk walk a little bit walk walk a little bit funny. So. All those things of designing with my body not working well due to my own stuttering or the accent. I said, wouldn't it be great if I could find a career where I could figure out why people aren't, aren't moving normally, then design things to help people who aren't moving more normally move normally. There's such a career. It's biomechanics, and that's what my story is, and that's what I want to do. But that's my story. And for a lot of applications to grad school and even some from national fellowships, I wrote with what I thought people wanted me to say. Then for one fellowship in particular, I wrote that story about me stuttering and being car accidents. I said, basically, what the heck, I'm just going to write this and see what happens. That's the one I got because that was the authentic story. And it's very clear for the reviewers to see when you're writing the very fluffy, generic thing, this is what you want to hear, versus a very clear narrative of, Here's why you want to be a professor. Here's why you want to work on cars. Here's why you want to work on alternative energy. Because that, that clarity of the story comes through because it's yours. Tell us your story and, be, and own it. Be confident about it and put it out there. If they don't like it, well, you probably won't be happy at that school anyway. Make it an active voice. Don't, use the, don't be very passive that, well, data were collected or experiments were run. No. What did you do specifically and what were your contributions to project teams, research, anything, things like that? And use the hourglass principle, particularly when you're talking about your past qualifications or your research. The hourglass principle, we mentioned it when we're writing a scientific abstract, you can shrink down your that principle starting broad at the top, narrow and throw it wide at the end. For paragraphs, we're talking about previous research projects, capstone projects, co-ops, or internships. Here's what the problem was. Here's the area. Here's what the problem was. So I did, my purpose was to do this. Here's what I did. I found this, and here's why, why someone cares. Broad to narrow, narrow, and throw it back out at the end. So go watch the lecture on how to give a how to write a scientific abstract. To do that, you can use those same sort of principles here in the essay to write a good statement of purpose. Grad school is great, so maybe you want to come here as well. We talked a little bit about, about why you might want to come here, how you can get supported to go to grad school, and writing a good and clear statement of purpose. We are telling your story, your own story, without a lot of fluff. Hope you enjoyed this. Hope you're considering grad school. Hope it helps you write a very strong and competitive application.